Hey everyone, welcome back to the Energy Blueprint Podcast. I'm your host, Ari Witten, and today I have with me Nadine Artemis, who is a speaker, health expert, and author of Holistic Dental Care and her newest book, Renegade Beauty, which I have right here. Uh, Nadine was kind enough to send this to me, and um, and I just read it actually earlier today. <laughs> and uh, so a little bit more about her. Nadine is the co-founder of Living Libations, a natural health and wellness and beauty company. Nadine seeks to inspire people to rethink the traditional concept of health and beauty with her paradigm of renegade beauty. And Nadine offers beauty and wellness products that bring out the strength of the botanicals without reliance on synthetics, which we're going to talk more about. So welcome to the show, Nadine. Thank you so much for inviting me on. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I'll mention now that we're recording. Um, prior to, to starting the recording, I was just commenting on how beautiful this this view is in the background there, and I love that you're involved in forest bathing and and <laughs> you are you're practicing a healthy lifestyle. And you you mention forest bathing in this book, which I love. Um, and I have to also say that. Um, for somebody who's more in the like skincare cosmetics realm, I, I was, to be honest, kind of anticipating this book to be a little bit fluffy and woo woo. And I have to say that I'm actually really impressed with what you did with this book. Uh, there's a lot of science integrated in, into this. Uh, there's a lot of valuable content. This is not just fluff. You did a phenomenal job with this. And I I highly recommend that people watching this pick this beauty up uh, for all kinds of do-it-yourself skincare stuff and uh, all kinds of just great health tips. Um, really, seriously, excellent job with this. And I, I really, I'm not that complimentary of a person. I, I don't compliment uh, most of the stuff that I see in the in the health field is not stuff that I particularly think is impressive or that I think is worth complimenting, but. Um, yeah, you did a you did a wonderful job with this book. So uh, I'm excited to dig into this material with you. Thank you. It's great. We can have a great dialogue since you've read it. <laughs> yeah. So toxins in personal care products, and and one of the things in your bio here that I just read is um, you're focusing on beauty and wellness products that bring out the strength of the botanicals without reliance on synthetics. And I think that's probably a good place to start. Um, as far as why not synthetics, and I think there's some people out there who, uh, who who think, you know, who are really impressed with a lot of these fancy ingredients on uh, on, on cosmetics, and you know, with, with all kinds of weird chemical names that they can't pronounce, and they think, oh, this must be really good science that you know that it's all kinds of this this advanced scientific technology that's producing these chemicals that are going to have miraculous effects on my skin. So some people are approaching it from that angle, and you, on the other hand, you're saying, I'm avoiding synthetics and specifically sticking to natural ingredients. So why do you think your paradigm is better than uh, that, that sort of chemical technology synthetic sort of approach to, to cosmetics and skincare? Well, I think, you know, when I go into it, to me, no pore no cell is parched for petroleum. You know, it's not something that we're depleted in. <laughs> it's not something that we need to put on our, our skin. And I think like, I th you know, hard to say who knows what, but I think we've understand now like the chemicals, the hormone disruptors, you know, we, we know about the perfumes and uh, the chemicals that they're making and that there's petroleum in skincare and there's aluminum deodorant. And we've really been had focused previous decades about them being hormone disruptors and finding parabens in the liver or uh, in diseased breast tissue when they test it. 99% of diseased breast tissue has paraben in it. Um, and you know, and that's like our daily dose of deodorant or our daily dose of lotion and then it's finding its way to our breast. Um, so we know that, but what's really new and I think really just delivers why we need to use botanicals even more is because of all the research that's been done in the past few decades about our microbiome mm. and understanding the skin's microbiome which is a whole other layer on top of this chemicals are endocrine disruptors we got a whole new reason to get off the synthetics and and i think that's like even more of an understanding because 
to me, I understand that a cell is like alive, but now we have to like expand our minds to understand like we are teeming with bacteria. You know, our skin's like this tapestry with trillions of bacteria. And that like, you know, I think of, so it's like all there right now, there's a whole party going on on a microscopic level. And we got this big hand that comes along. I always just sort of imagine like a comic version. And then we're like, our hand is delivering those toxins and mutating the microbiome and um, disrupting their whole life force, their food system. So we're scrubbing away the sebum that the, the cells need to, I mean, sorry, that the microbiome needs to thrive. We're like over exfoliating and getting rid of the, the food supply that the bacteria needs. So we really got to like tone that down and get back to things that are compatible with our bodies, with our cells and with our microbiome. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really important angle that a lot of people don't talk about and are unaware of is, is this idea that we not only have a gut microbiome, all these trillions of bacteria living in our gut, but we have basically the same thing on our skin surface as well. And they, and they play a role in our skin health. So I, I think there's like kind of the way I see it, there's three layers, at least three layers, maybe I'm missing one, but uh, at least three layers to how uh, you know, personal care products, I think, relate to health and, and, you know, what a lot of people on this podcast, listeners of this podcast are interested in and what I'm interested in, um, overall health and energy optimization, um, and, and how personal care products fit into that, which are um, endocrine disruption, so potentially disrupting hormonal balance in your body. Uh, a lot of these chemicals that are in these compounds, um, for example, phthalates, BPA, or um, heavy metals have also been shown to be directly toxic to mitochondria in our cells, which are, are, are the energy producers in our cells, and this layer of the skin microbiome. Um, and maybe, I don't know if I'm missing any other. Yeah, totally. Cool. So um, I would love if maybe we could dig into some of those other areas. And I know you kind of you, you mentioned in passing like parabens and, and some of these endocrine disruptors, but maybe so a lot of the listeners are not actually familiar with the idea that there are compounds in, you know, common skincare and personal care products that are having negative effects on their physiology. Maybe they're just completely unaware of that. So can you talk kind of just back up and assume that the listener is knows nothing about any of these topics and talk about some of uh, some of those key compounds that have been shown to to create damage to our health. Yeah, so there's so many, like like thousands. And so, you know, we got to, you know, we can't talk about them all in a way, but there's also like there's the specifics. And then also as a group, we just know, like we don't want to go there. So if it, and, and the, the words are going to be all very because a product is made really with four different ways. You have your pres preservation system, you have your oil, and then you're either gonna add water to that or like a surfactant. So that's like in a modern cosmetic thing. Where we wanna take it is to just like water, lipids, which are your fats, the medicine part, and then the seeds. That's like a whole other thing, but that's really all you need. But in this chemical world, we have thousands of chemical cocktails. And then there's the family. So you've got your surfactant realm, which could be your sodium lauryl sulfates. And that's the stuff that's scrubbing and foaming. And those disrupt the, um, the, uh, sorry, the epithelium in our mouths, which is one layer thick. So if you've got sodium lauryl sulfate in your toothpaste. And then in our skin, we've got the dermis and then the epidermis, which is most of our activity where we're accessing it is the epidermis. That's the very thin top layer of the skin. It's one millimeter, so it's like a credit card. And in that credit card sideways is four layers of skin layers that are doing a whole bunch of stuff. And that's just the epidermis, not the dermis. And so anything that we're putting on is going to, affect that and then you, so then within that realm so you've got the, the foaming things and then you've got your your their version of oils which could be your petroleum oil soy oil or like a polymer like literally just like plasticky polymer things that they're liquidizing and then within petroleum there is like a hundred versions of some kind of petroleum thing and when you're reading it you don't even know that it was petroleum at some point and so those are all toxic to our cells. 
And then there's the preservation system. So it could be parabens, but the parabens are only used because that's always the argument, like, because a certified organic skincare it only has to be 70% certified organic ingredients. That other 30, the list is crazy of what is allowed. Like I would never put that on my body. And parabens are allowed. And then a lot of people are just like, well, it's only 0.01% because it, it is that effective. It's very potent. It's infinitesimal in a way in what it's used, but that's all it's okay. ever. Are you talking about parabens? When you yeah. Say okay. So to make it a, an effective preservation, you only need 0.01%. So it's okay. like minor, but it, it really, it works. It does preserve. And, and real quick, what, what are parabens and what are they doing? Are, are they... It put in these formulas because they're like preserving the product or because they're intended to do something beneficial for, for our skin or, or what? It's really just to preserve the product. Okay. That's its main thing. It really has no, yeah, it's not like a thing like, ooh, now with parabens. Okay. <laughs> for helping your wrinkles. So it's just the preservation system. It's a very popular one, but it's only ever used in that tiny amount. And that's what's showing up in our breasts, right? So we know that different chemicals have different, um, What's the, 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 it's not a shelf life. You're like um, half-life. Thank you, half-life. That was coming in. I was like, is it half-life? Yeah. Mm. That, so, right? Like the, the half-life of mercury versus, you know, so I don't know the specifics, but it's a tenacious chemical. Or mm. then you have the, you could have any, uh, like a triclosan in there or something as well, which is, is like within an antibiotic sort of realm. It, it's not good on eco, on water systems. So yeah, forget the yeah, damage. And, and that one's actually gotten to the point now where there's so much negative research that's accumulated that they, they've actually banned that from being in yes, products, which is, but, which, it, which is great. But the problem is that like most people have been using products like soaps and you know, even like just hand soaps or, or, or hand sanitizers or yeah. various personal care products that, that have it for the last 10 years or, or 15 years or however long it's been around. Exactly. And studies show it makes us more vulnerable to superbugs. Mm -hmm. It lowers your immune system. Yeah. Go figure, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So parabens, yeah. what, what, what else is in there? And I'll mention one thing that I know about that's, that's pretty shocking. And that I think a lot of people would be shocked by is how common heavy metals are in a lot of like makeup products. I think makeup, especially like, I mean, probably a lot of people listening to this are unaware of the fact that there's lots of research showing that most common like lipstick brands and many types of very popular makeup brands, mainstream makeup brands have lead in them. Like lead is a very, very toxic heavy metal that is known to cause all kinds of harm to our body. And it is being absorbed through our skin into our body, disrupting hormones, uh, damaging mitochondria, causing all kinds of negative effects. And, and people just have no clue when they're putting this stuff on every day that there's heavy metals in there. Totally, heavy metals and mercury. And then there's mercury in a lot of like bleaching creams. And it should be banned. Like there are regulations on these things, but things slip through and now we can really shop quite internationally. So yeah, it's just, it's a scary situation. And we are, uh, the average North American woman, woman is, is accumulating five pounds a year of chemicals in their body and that's like the if you take remove the water from the cosmetics if, it, if you add in the water the stack goes to like 35 pounds mm. which is hard to imagine but five pounds we're like putting applying onto our bodies and into our bodies every wow. year and wow. so also an average woman just doing like a normal day of uh, ablutions and washing her face would have over 200 chemicals applied to her body wow and I think we think we don't absorb it or like, oh, it's our skin, you know, and it, everything that you're putting on your skin goes in and it doesn't have the same filtering system. So apparently the stat is having a chlorinated shower is more toxic than drinking an eight ounce glass of chlorinated water mm -hmm. because it's being absorbed and inhaled into the body. And um, with our, so with, when we're drinking the water that's chlorinated, we have our... Um, digestive system our liver and our kidneys to help process it but when we're applying it to the skin it just goes right into the bloodstream and ends up in our organs mm. crazy stuff it's yeah. it's i mean it's just it's honestly just kind of 
madness that there's so much nasty stuff in in these commonly used products extremely popular products and most people just have no clue about it and i i also want to mention that there are some people out there who think any talk of toxins in you know in these types of products is is just woo woo and nonsense and kind of new agey like fear mongering around toxins around people who don't understand toxins but there's actually science every step of the way here. I mean, we know that these compounds do have, I mean, there's, there's science testing the fact that these compounds do have things like heavy metals and, and all kinds of other hormone disrupting compounds. We know that they do get absorbed in, through the skin into our bodies, that they do actually have hormonal disrupting effects, mitochondria damaging effects, skin microbiome damaging effects. Um, and, and we know that, you know, all of these things are actually happening. So there, there is real data showing that this is a very real health concern. And I, I just want to mention that for everybody listening who is inclined to brush all of this stuff off as, as woo woo sort of nonsense, like hippie nonsense. Oh yeah. You and your essential oils, like I'll stick to my, you know, Neutrogena, whatever. Um, so I, I think it's really worth mentioning just that this is actually science-based. Totally science-based. And also it's the one area, I mean, we definitely have control over it, which is kind of exciting because you can't always, you know, the air that you're breathing or, you know, there's things that we can't necessarily change, but we're, we can literally do that. And the thing is too, it's 2018. So it's not like I'm saying, do throw them all away and then you've got nothing it's mm -hmm. a banquet what is available and the realm that you get to like play in is so exciting it's so juicy it's such a celebration of life instead of this lifeless liquid that's mm -hmm. just like not doing anything i mean what really fascinated me when I, in when i was like just a teenager and and going into all this stuff when i learned that perfumers were the medicine makers and medicine makers were the perfumists in many different cultures. I found that so fascinating. There was no division between a perfume and a medicine. Mm. And it wasn't until the, the, the 19th century when we started making synthetics that then there was that division. And then the plant realm became like frivolous fem femininity, kind of like perfumes and all that. And then the medicines became like the extracts and then those extracts got refined and refined and then synthesized and all of that. But that what you know perfumes used to be pressed from petals and what we applied to our skin was just you know tinctures and sluice from sap and like all this juicy stuff that was applied to the body and then it just became petroleum all the way how can we use petroleum and bleach it and refine it and fluff it up into a white pristine cream and then just put a whole marketing campaign on it and there's nothing in the bottle like it's just so negative to the body it's just really nothing for you there's nothing in there in these things except there is that feeling of moisture and lubrication or so you know it does foam yeah that, that's a really really fascinating observation and you got my wheels turning as, as as you were talking there because it's you know the way that kind of the the most people look at these th I, I was kind of lumping them into three categories into my head, like perfumes, like scents, things yeah. that we wear to smell good, um, personal care products, skin care products, dental products, whatever, other personal care products, um, and then medicines, you know, yeah. things we take to make ourselves healthier. In the, the modern, like mainstream approach, these are very, very different categories. You know, we have our moisturizers and our our colognes and our perfumes and stuff like that. And, um, and then we have our medicines and there's no overlap at all in these, th these three categories. But then when you look at what you're doing and you're doing certain kinds of things within the realm of personal care products, within the realm of scents and, and things like that. Um, and then this category of medicine, and then you realize, the types of products that you're producing have medicinal effects. They smell good and they're benefiting cellular health. They're not just something to smell nice and they're not only not damaging to like our hormones or our mitochondria or our skin microbiome, but they're actually benefiting our health. They're anti-inflammatory compounds. Uh, they benefit brain health, all, uh, you know, all these different layers of benefits. And so what you're doing actually is very much this kind of, 
interconnection of these three areas of like smell good while improving your health while you know having all these benefits uh, on, on every aspect of, of those things yeah exactly. and that to me is it's fun it's convenient and it makes sense you know like it's just such a celebration you remind me of the there's an ancient greek word called thiamectomy and it means let perfume be your medicine mm, that's cute i like that <laughs> Nice. So um, I want to go back to the microbiome, the skin microbiome a little bit, because I think that's a fascinating topic. Um, yes. I'm, I'm curious if you found any particular research around like specific ingredients that, um, you know, in common, you know, popular mainstream products that are particularly damaging to the skin microbiome. And, um, and then the second part of this question after that is, have you found any ingredients or products that are really supportive of skin microbiome health? Yeah, that's a great question. For sure, there is, I think this is a fascinating one, is surfactants, which is, you know, soap. So you can still have your natural bar soap, you know, hopefully you get something really natural made from like a farmer's market or something. And then you use that for, you know, scrubbing your nails and, and um, washing your hands and pits and bits. But that's all you need it for. <laughs> you don't need to wash your face with soap ever. Like, just don't. And and I'll tell you in a minute. And like, you're, you know, that like, so I think of like the dial ad or the Irish spring and they're lathering their body so much that just that put that out of your head because our skin, no area of our skin needs that. So the fascinating research on surfactants is because we, right, how do we wash our face in North America? It's like, just foam it up. And that's how people feel, like just we think that's what clean is. And studies show that surfactants, whether it's from a mild foaming face cleanser from the health food store, or your really whatever, I don't know whatever they're selling now these days, like from Sephora. And these surfactants lodge themselves into the stratum corneum, which is your top layer of your epidermis. And they stay there even after rinsing. Mm. So every day, maybe twice a day, we are just lodging those into our skin. Mm. And it's, it's all microscopic. And then we've got this habitual use and chronic, it will cause chronic inflammation, irritation, which may lead to things like melasma, which is hyperpigmentation. It's certainly not the only cause of it. Or it could lead to acne or rosacea because you've thrown off that whole ecosystem that your skin's oasis is just like totally thrown off by that. And um, yes, we got to ditch the soap, which I think people are surprised at with, with the skin's microbiome. I think what might be more obvious are things like chlorine. So showering in chlorine is really affecting the microbes that keep your skin from drying out. So for, a, and again, you know, somebody could shower in chlorine and they have a different experience, but one person's got like dandruff and, they can't get away from that dry, itchy skin or they're having eczema. So not everybody's going to get eczema from that, but it just depends what your Achilles heel is and then when you're combining it with different things. So definitely everybody should be getting a shower filter if you don't have access to um, clean water that's coming from your taps. Uh, so that to me is an obvious one, like a chlorine would be pretty obvious. Now when you've got, then we create these, um, you know, so we've got these skincare regimes with petroleum and different chemicals and then we're probably going, why we spend so much money and we're doing all this stuff, but why is the acne still here? Or it worked for a bit, but then it didn't. Because we're getting into this vicious cycle because now we've removed food sources and we've mutated microbes, we've made ones missing, we're like killing off diversity on our skin. All that's going on and you might venture off to visit like a dermatologist. Mm -hmm. And then they're gonna bring out the harder stuff. So cortisone creams and steroids, um, you know, either internally or topically. And then that is just like further going to deplete your teams of bacteria. And so really any skin therapy should be working on building diversity in the skin's microbiome, not further depleting it. Because again, that might be effective for like a week and then like all the problems are going to come out again and probably a little bit stronger. Sort wow. of made the beast a bit stronger. So what... If, if we shouldn't scrub our face with facial cleansers and soap, what should we scrub our face and our body with to, I guess, keep things clean? Yeah. Um, 
and, and also support skin and skin microbiome health? So we go, we look to ancient uh, practices and then what we, we find is oil, which is so like a mind trip for people, that, especially if they have acne, they're just like, what? Mm. But again, we're not gonna be using um, petroleum oil, baby oil, mineral oil are some of its names. And we're not gonna be using like rancid almond oil or grapeseed oil. You wanna use really good quality, like a pure virgin organic real olive oil. Uh, jojoba is my absolute favorite. So you wanna get an organic jojoba oil. That is good for everybody's skin type. It's actually a liquid wax, not a plant oil. So it, it's very stable. And it's an oil that mimics our sebum unlike any other oil on the planet. Mm. And it, so you just wet a cloth, put a squirt of oil on there, and then you're just, you know, it's like you're washing your face. Kind of it's the same actions that you do. You're just doing with oil and it lifts up dirt from pores. It unclogs pores. It removes makeup if you need that. And that's what you do. And you can do that to your whole skin. Like you can do it before your shower. Um, if you want and then you can even use like what the ancients would do was gua sha and so they would use like a piece of wood or a stone or a crystal or like a piece of metal a striegel was in ancient Greece and then they would um, oil up the skin and then uh, just do this motion with that stick and then lots of stuff would come out and, uh, and yeah and for people who are listening to this and not watching yeah I, I don't <laughs> know if there's a good word for that either but basically like pre press your 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 the, the the object the stick or the piece of metal or, or whatever it is um against your arm and kind of you know put some pressure on it and then kind of do an, an upward or or is it only upward or downward motion i think upwards is the best motion but it doesn't totally matter and you do put a bit of pressure and you can do you can do whatever pressure you want but it also a light pressure is more lymphatic it'll actually tone the lymphatic system mm -hmm. and then you go a little bit deeper on the pressure and you're working with the fascia now that's a little advanced, so you don't have, I'm not trying to say get fancier with your, you know, your morning shower, because really what I'm saying is quite simple. You're going to put oil on your face, wash it, and then you're going to get out of the bath shower and oil up your body and you're good to go. Well, um, I like that. It, this is like, this is like, um, you're killing two birds with one stone too, because yeah. it's like, it's almost like self massage or, um, uh, self myofascial release. You know, you're, 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 it's almost like massage or, or, or foam rolling or something like yeah. that. But yeah, with the oil, and then you're like toning your skin and conditioning it at the same time. Mm -hmm. It's pretty sweet. And you know what else is fun is even applying the oil afterwards with a cloth, like you're doing with the face. It gives like the very gentlest exfoliation to your skin, and the oil really sinks in even deeper. Interesting. So um, you mentioned one thing about jojoba oil mimicking sebum. Um, yes. I, I'm glad you brought that up because I was actually going to ask. I, I was under the impression that coconut oil was like I've heard people recommend coconut oil because it's very similar to our sebum. But you, your opinion, jojoba is more. Similar. Jojoba to me is like the king or the queen, um, and definitely I love coconut oil. It's in many of our formulas. I do find you probably want to dilute it though with a jojoba or olive oil just so that it's liquid mm. when unless you're like tropical or you can keep it warm and it's really nice to just even combine them coconut oil is, is a beautiful thing those are like the top three like just really practical oils that you know are going to be good quality and then you don't have to go into that peach kernel almond oil grapeseed realm because they're often not real they're often rancid and like grapeseed oil is is with solvents it's it's made with solvents it's, mm. it shouldn't actually be the color it is it would be a really glommy thick thing and those are the cheap oils that are often used in the industry. Okay, so jojoba, coconut oil, and, and extra virgin olive oil, is that yeah. correct? Okay. Um, a question on moisturizers. I've known some people over the years, especially women who uh, use moisturizers, skin moisturizers regularly. Um, and I've, I've known people, not, not my wife, but friends girl, previous girlfriends years ago who who used like mainstream regular sort of skin moisturizers yes um, and and also like chapsticks as well yes. um the same the same principle applies but what what i'm getting at is that a lot of these people there's there's sort of like an addiction effect from what i can tell where once you start using these things uh, it seems to me that the skin stops working as it should. It stops producing its own oils and keeping its own moisture properly. And then you get, 
you get dry skin whenever you don't use that stuff regularly. And then you, you get in this sort of vicious cycle where you have to constantly keep applying this stuff for your skin to be properly moisturized. So is my observation on that correct? And um, so correct. Yes. Okay. And it's, I love seeing the difference because then somebody will switch over to like a lip balm I've made. And they're like, oh my God, it's lasting me a year. Mm. Just put it on in the morning and their lips are moist all day. So what's going on there? What's actually happening that like these what are these things doing to our to our skin that yeah, we're creating one of those vicious cycles which will manifest sort of differently for everybody and for many it's just that common dry irritated skin so you have to keep putting on this layer of moisture and those products you mentioned i mean if it is just a classic cream from the drugstore or a classic chapstick they've got petroleum products in them you know and that's like a layer it's like an invisible saran wrap. So yeah, from the things we've talked about, like endocrine disruption and microbiome disruption, then there's just, I mean, there's so many ways that we could look at it, but then there's just like a letting the skin breathe. Like how about that? So besides our polyester clothing and underwear, then we've got the, the you know, the, the creams that are putting on this microscopic saran wrap and our skin can't breathe. And because it's there's it's a two way thing. Like what I I'm always amazed at the stat, and I don't quite know it, but that amount of pounds that our, our skin sheds every day, it's like a few pounds, and you're kind of like where did it where, mm. <laughs> right? So we're we're let our skin is just this it's it's a breathing living tissue. I like to refer to it as the moist envelope of our soul, but we've been treating <laughs> it like it's like a plastic bag or something. <laughs> Interesting. So. The, the idea of letting the skin breathe is, is interesting. Now, how does that relate to the oils that you use? Do, do those still allow the skin to breathe? Oh, yeah. It's full. Everything's flowing and breathing. And then, oh, yeah, to answer a question from before that we didn't get to, um, so we got to new questions, was what, uh, what isn't disturbing the microbiome? Mm. Right? So that was, that's so fascinating, too, because I've been working with this palette of beautiful plants for, for a few decades and the microbiome stuff is newer. And so when I get to go into that research, because, because of antibiotic resistance and those kind of issues right now, I, sorry about the not light situation. Yeah, no worries. Okay. We get to look at your, your silhouette with yeah. the beautiful background of the, the forest and the lake behind you. <laughs> Sun setting. Um, it's so, I thought, I, the microbiome is so fascinating to me, as you probably could tell from the book, but it's so fun because we have a huge crisis right now of antibiotic resistance. And so much of science and research is, is what can, what, what, how can we solve this? Because it's not more antibiotics. And then the whole world of essential oils opens up and we understand why people have been using these plants forever. We have the modern science giving us data on, oh, that's why people were using frankincense and oral care forever, or, or that on their skin forever. And, and so we find out that essential oils are very effective quorum sensing inhibitors, short for QSI, or that would be the abbreviation. And what those are is they inhibit the gene expression of the pathogens in our bodies. So pathogens are kind of free floating in our bodies like, like phytoplankton in the ocean, but then when they gain, there's other friends in the body, then they can gain traction by like communicating and joining forces. And then that's when they start creating biofilms and creating- And, and that's the, the term that you used earlier, just to clarify for people. Yeah. Quorum sensing is that sort of when there are big groups of pathogenic bacteria that are kind of communicating with one another. Yes, thank you for that. And then, um, so what essential oils do is they inhibit the quorum sensing very effectively. Now we're gonna have different to varying degrees, like clove oil is like 70% effective, and then it would depend on what pathogen, so it would be like very detailed. But in general, we can say that essential oils are effective at tidying up the pathogens, but working with the friendly bacteria. Mm. So there's this intelligence, right, That I'm sure we'll study a lot in science and then there'll just be, there's always going to be a certain je ne sais quoi, a certain mystery that we don't know how it all works, but that's where the plants come in. So they're really a, a true friend right now for us because, and then they can do things that we want in skincare that we're, we've been, you know, sold that that's what we want, like, like inhibiting collagen destruction or lengthening telomeres 
or uh, giving us the antibacterial boost we need when we've got acne or helping those dermadex mite when we're, mites when we're experiencing rosacea. So the essential oils are these, like I like to refer to them as botanical biotics because biotics means life. Antibiotic is not life. And these are our botanical biotics, which is the botanical medicine that we can then use to really activate this beautiful jojoba or the olive oil. And then that's the fat, the beautiful fat that's gonna deliver that juice into your skin and then it's so fun if that goes into the rest of your body because it works well with the liver mm -hmm. and it's helping the lungs and it's helping on a cellular level and then we're delivering these really healthy monoterpenes which is the building block of the essential oils into our body and we're having fun at the same time and it smells great mm -hmm. you know and it's all good news <laughs> yeah yeah like like we were saying before this kind of um interface between perfumes and, and, and smells and, and uh, personal care and skin care and all, all that good stuff and medicine actually making your, your cells function better. So fascinating stuff. So um, we've talked a lot about stuff that's not good so far. Yeah. I, I, let's, let's switch to some of the stuff that, that is particularly good. And I know you've mentioned a, f a few of these things in passing, but what are some of the, the most beneficial botanical compounds when it comes to uh, we'll start with skin health and then we'll maybe shift to some of the the other areas of personal care products sure you know there's so many and they're all like my children so i love them all <laughs> but we do have the really some classics like frankincense which i just mentioned is so beautiful you know for men for women it's strengthening it's uh I feel like it's, it's about fortitude and fortifying and even good fortune. And on a cellular level, and if you just go into pub meds and pull up frankincense, you'd be blown away by the stuff that's going on and what it can do and how it can stop the skin and cells from going down pathways that we don't want the skin and cells to do. And how, you know, and I just, it can help just clearing up melasma and hyperpigmentation, just so many skin problems that, um, that are so common now and they're literally there's answers for it and it's from the natural world and they've been existing forever and they're effective and so we you know we don't have to use the petroleum and it wasn't working anyway <laughs> beautiful and any other oh yeah um, one or two compounds rose you want to mention there yeah rose auto which is the steam distilled version of rose is so medicinal like it's right rose is so beautiful and it's so sensual but at the same time it's such potent medicine it's also analgesic. It's like got even a numbing thing. You could even put it on a toothache. It's really, really exquisite. Um, Immortal is another essential oil. The Latin name is Hilichrysum italicum. I've been getting ours distilled on the island of Corsica forever. I have, you know, we have a reserve list. We only get a few liters each year. It's so special at healing scars. Mm -hmm. and, and you can pour it into like, you know, if you have... Um, cuts or nicks or anything like that. The essential oils are good at healing old scars and new scars. So if you've got something that's got a keloid you want to work down, or if you just had a situation and then you want to prevent scars from forming, you want to get the essential oil. So essential oils you're generally diluting to use because they're so potent you're using it by the drop, but there are times when you just want that drop undiluted. Mm. So, you know, you could pour it right in, clean something, it cleans it, it seals it, it starts sealing the skin. And then once the skin is sealed, because they're all an analgesic, antibacterial, antifungal, antiviral, it's like all the things you want to clean a cut or something like that, the skin starts closing and then you can, um, then you start working then with an oil with that. So you could add the frankincense to a jojoba and then prevent the scars. So they're just really, they're kind of magic, the magic bullet we need. <laughs> mm, fascinating. So uh, a couple specific questions on skin health. Um, do you have any tips for hyperpigmentation i know you mentioned frankincense yes. um but is there anything else on hyperpigmentation and then also for like eczema or psoriasis do you have any tips for those yeah. so everything that you're mentioning uh, we always have a blend or something for that and people can also make their own because you could even just look on the ingredients that we're using and then make your own it's like that easy um so we make combos are usually good because always diversity right it just helps but you can also just use a single like frankincense but for the melasma or hyperpigmentation, some of my favorite oils are frankincense, cypress, immortelle, and rosado. 
Myrrh is also good. And sometimes you might want to try something for a while and then switch it up the next month. The main thing is it may take a little bit longer, like, I don't know, longer as compared to what, but you just, you got to stick to it Two, you know, two applications a day for like two months. Shit, does some people it completely disappears? Some people it like fades, and it's really great. Like there's totally hope for bringing that all into balance. And then also, I have lots of tips on how to even prevent that in the first place and how it comes because it could be coming from a birth control pill or your sunblock or eating a lot of um, canola or mazola oil. Those are the three huge areas that are creating melasma for people. Mm. So psoriasis and eczema are actually in those areas. That's where there's been a drop in microbial diversity. Mm. That's when you get that reaction. And so for that, first you want to start thinking of the symptoms. Usually there's an itchiness and um, that's the biggest thing. So if we can get the itchiness down, then that stops the person from like making it worse. And peppermint is such a great essential oil because it literally is cooling. Like it's not just anti-inflammatory and calming, it's cooling. It like, it's, like, you, it's like you don't need ice. You got a cut or a bite or a sting, peppermint, and then you can walk around and you don't have to put ice on or your headache, and then you can just put two drops there. And so what that is, is it totally t stops the itch. So you take a little jojoba, put some peppermint in there, and then the itch is gone. And then to just calm the whole thing down, um, you know, oils like the yarrow, blue tansy, the chamomile, frankincense, peppermint, those are really all good at, but for both eczema and psoriasis. Okay. Do you, just out of curiosity, do you have a formula for those? Do you have one for hyperpigmentation? Do you have one for, what, what other have, kinds of like skin formulas do you have? We call, so we have, um, we have four beauty realms. And then within them, we can chart all the different things so that we can kind of group things. So there's that real calming and cooling realm. So things like eczema and psoriasis or like a hive or red, you know, when people just have like a, it's not eczema psoriasis, but it's like a red bump or, you know, anything that's sort of like angry and irritated, that's that realm, which is the Blythe Beauty realm. And in there we have frankincense best skin ever. And then we have these potent skin spot treatments called the doodabs. And that doodab is called B doodab, and it's even blue. It's so it, it's pure essential oil blend, and you just take one drop and add it to the area that needs it or your hyperpigmentation. And then for melasma, there's two realms because there's sort of two ways that people experience it. And for that, there's doodab or jewel dab. We have fun naming things. <laughs> and then with that, you've got the sandalwood best skin ever or the rose best skin ever. And then we have a realm called the brilliant beauty realm, which is like your acne, fungal, thrush, candida, you know, you're getting those more fungal rashes and that kind of thing. And that one's the, the doodab for that's zippity doodab. <laughs> nice. That's just care of acne like overnight. You just put a drop on or you can mix it with clay. And uh, so we have all the solutions, but we also like to educate people too on how they can just get it and you know just get their own hoho bar their own frankincense and combine things too it's that easy yeah absolutely so i want to shift um into dental care which i know is another big area of passion for you um what are some of the biggest problems with conventional dental care products and and i guess we'll start with that and then we'll shift into maybe some of the more beneficial compounds for, for, for sure well, we can see a pattern emerging because then we have an oral microbiome, mm -hmm. which is really a, a very focused and, and important uh, microbiome that's obviously through the alimentary canal hooked up to our gut microbiome. And everything that we're applying on a commercial level, is not, not good. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of creating the perfect storm for dental issues. We're creating the perfect storm for bleeding gums, which apparently over 90% of the population have issues with their gums or inflamed gums and so the sodium lauryl sulfate is going right into the bloodstream uh, mercury fillings are throwing off the oral microbiome uh, obviously the sodium lauryl sulfate is throwing off the microbiome our alcoholic uh, mouth rinses totally throwing off the microbiome not to mention stuff that might be applied or put on at the dentist office and so you know or the petroleum waxed dental floss you know like it's like every faucet is no good um so you want to just clear that out and if you just replaced 
with baking soda, like you could get that simple. You'd be way better off. Now we can upgrade that. We can biohack that, but literally clear that out and just get the baking soda and you'd be off to a good start. And maybe some, you know, coconut oil for oil swishing and pulling. Yeah, actually, on that note, I just saw a study uh, a few yeah. days ago on, on baking soda, decreasing bleeding gums and, and gingivitis and plaque formation. So there, there's yeah, actually research alkaline. to support that this, I mean, you can get baking soda for like 99 cents for, uh, for a, a five month supply. So yeah. uh, it's kind of amazing, you know, this is not exactly something that's some exotic ingredient that you need to go spend a fortune on instead of standard tooth care. It's a standard toothpaste. It's actually cheaper. Oh yeah. Like, and really what you'd be using in your mouth, like in a year, in a year is so tiny. Yeah. And also just for interest sake, um, all baking soda is, is, is aluminum free. It's, it's, I mean, it's baking powder that's got the aluminum issue. So you could feel free to get the stuff at the supermarket. Yeah, there's some, I've seen that sort of the myth around the idea yes. that, that baking soda has aluminum in it. Yeah, so feel free. And that's just one fun thing to do to really help gums is to coat the brush your teeth first, first with the baking soda and then just get on a kind of really sloppy bunch of baking soda. And then you take a teaspoon half a teaspoon of apple cider vinegar which is an acid but uh, baking soda is so alkaline that the sum total is still in the alkaline realm and then you pour that in you have like a full science experiment going on in your mouth <laughs> it, it, kids love it which is great because they are not good teeth brushers are you teaching people how to create an explosion in their mouth yeah. <laughs> and then that lifts off all the plaque and the first time i did it i was like whole my mouth was so clean like it was a travel day too which feels like you get more plaque on travel days for some reason i was like in la at that time and my i felt like i'd still brushed my teeth like just five minutes ago it's so good and that method was invented by dr paul keys who was a, a, a dental surgeon and he was like how can we stop doing all these gum grafts because they're they usually you got to go back and get another one in a few years because it's not a solution. It's a band-aid. And we, I like to really get into the situations where you're doing something deeply, hopefully just sort of setting it and forgetting it. And then you don't have to think about it again. Instead of having a whole system of taking care of our bodies with a bunch of band-aids and it's just like too complicated and it's not effective. Yeah. So baking soda, kind of scrub with a toothbrush. Is that yep. correct? And then... While the baking soda is still in there, you 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 just kind of yeah, take. You a have cup. a round where you're getting, you know, doing brushing and spitting, and then have a round where you're just sort of like applying it really on there, and then just get that half teaspoon of apple cider vinegar. Close your mouth, swish it around. Take the toothbrush again, brush it a bit, spit that out, and it's so fresh and clean. Interesting. I'm gonna have to try that. Yeah, let me know how it goes. Okay, I will. Um, and then you also have some some dental care formulas. Yeah, we go correct? deep into that realm. And so besides like the normal things like paste and all that, we make dental paste. We have swishing serums, which are oil pulling serums with like CoQ10. And then we make really three really concentrated dental serums that are just concentrated. And you take one drop and you put it along your floss, for example. And then you're getting up into that area. You're getting the essential oils into that area. Most people that have bleeding gums find that like they just have to do that once, it's gone. Some people, it could depending you know on their sponginess of their gums, it could take two weeks to clear that up. But like the power is really quite fast for many people, and it's all they needed. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if you're flossing all the time and gums are bleeding, you know that's you, your mouth is telling you that you got to change things. But literally, even just sodium lauryl sulfate can make gums very susceptible to bleeding. Yeah. Which is, and and for people that don't know that ingredient, it's it's a very common ingredient in the majority of toothpaste out there, even yeah, even natural yeah, toothpaste. Majority, like it's in anything that has a bit of a foam, really. Like, you know, your shampoo, your soap, mm -hmm. your toothpaste. It's it's in so many things, and and, and there's like twenty versions of it mm -hmm. with like different suffix, suffixes at the end, and you know, it gets crazy in that world with language. Um, yeah. Yeah, so like we're just making our mouth so susceptible. And for example, strep, which is, is, is a bacteria that does cause cavities, it's in everybody's mouth. 
all the time, even the people with the perfect checkup. But what is it, how is it causing cavities when it does? Well, that's because we're creating the environment where we're not, you know, we may be stripping away its, its bacterial buddies because it needs, the bacteria needs other bacteria to keep the other bacteria in check. Mm. To prevent the sort of pathogen parties that are coming up. And so that's where you, you want to keep that in balance. And then everything we're doing to our mouths is stripping away that diversity, mutating the microbes, or literally killing them off. And so there isn't that microbe anymore. So we want to think, when we think of what we want to do for our mouths, we want to stop using the stuff, the alcoholic uh, mouthwash and that sort of stuff. And then we want to seal, which is sealing your gums from bleeding. You want to make sure that that's all cool. And then you want to get the gums back. Like I call it like having a turtleneck around. It's like every gum is like a turtleneck around the tooth. And you want a turtleneck, not a cowl neck or a V-neck. That's when the gums start receding. So you really want to get the gum pockets back up, seal the teeth. And then we want to think about reseeding. So and let, that's, let me, let me yeah. ask you ju just on that point of sealing the gum pockets and, and kind of supporting gum health. What, what in particular does that best? I feel like the dental serums, um, the, we have an ozonated gel, which is amazing. Stopping using that stuff, like that really, that alone could stop it for the bleeding gums for somebody. It's just like moving to that baking soda. Mm. Um, and then, yeah, really how you're caring for your body. You know, you may also need to take care of a leaky gut. Because to me, that when you have a bleeding gum in the mouth, that's kind of like your mouth's version of a leaky gut. Mm. And we have the same thing on our skin. With, with the psoriasis or an eczema, that is like a, a, you know, like a leaky skin. It's open, things are happening. So we want to seal the skin. We want to seal the mouth, seal the guts. And, so, and also you may, need to, you may need to change up your diet to also seal that mouth, which is, you know, we don't want to be eating things like GMOs because that's, the thing with the GMOs is that they say that it's okay because humans don't have a shikimate pathway which is what the chemicals used in things like Roundup are affecting in the plant to, to be a pesticide. But now, by understanding the microbiome, we now know, no, we don't have one, but the billions of microbes on us, they all have one. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to be eating pesticides because mm -hmm. we have our own ecosystem as well. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Oh, mercury okay. fillings can create bleeding gums? Yeah. Well, so there's a number of other, I think, related areas we could go into, but we don't have endless time. I'm, I'm, I want to be sensitive to time here. I mean, hair and, um, you know, female hygiene, deodorant. I mean, there's a lot of different areas of this or, or kind of deeper into the uh, fragrances and stuff like that. One area that I do want to go into a little bit is um, your take on sun exposure mm -hmm. and sunscreens. So can you, can you talk about your take on on sun and the role of that in skin health and in skin aging and um, traditional sort of mainstream sunscreens mainstream thinking on that whole stuff and, and sunscreen products and how your take on things differs from that for sure i love talking about the sun uh and i have devoted a whole chapter about it in the book because we also really need to undo so much information because I feel like we've really been lobbied into this loss of sunlight and it's such a beautiful thing because we wouldn't be here <laughs> if there was no sun mm -hmm. so the fear this like ah the sun we gotta we gotta re-examine that obviously it can burn us and we don't want to be burned all the time but if you do burn your skin once in a while it's okay you're gonna be okay um, and th this is a really interesting thing. Your skin, your DNA deals better with a sunburn than it does you applying sunblock and sitting or sunscreen and sitting in the sun for a few hours. <laughs> <laughs> explain, ex elaborate on that. Explain what you mean by that. So the, bot, the DNA can process the excess heat of the burn and it can deal with 99.9% of, .9 of the damage from that burn and clean it up. But when we're putting those, that sunscreen on us, we're deactivating our, our body's warning system to say, get out of the sun. So there's that. We're separating the rays. So we don't even know to this day all of the rays that the sun has and the, and the wavelengths that it's providing for us. But we do know some, UVA, UVB for starters. 
And what sunscreen is doing, again, besides all those chemicals and the hormone disruptors and the oxybenzene, which is not carcinogenic until it is exposed to sunlight, which is the main active ingredient, which, for example, Hawaii state legislator is trying to ban, it just put in paperwork to have that uh, sunscreens with oxybenzene banned from Hawaii to save the coral reef. Because they are literally killing the coral reef, especially around Australia, you know, wherever there is one, but Australia, Caribbean, Hawaii, they're, they're losing their coral reef, which is so essential. So we can't even imagine what it's doing to our bodies. But yeah, besides and, and all that, so I, I just want to interrupt on that point real yes. quick, because I, I just want to mention, I'm glad you brought this up, because there's so many things that humans do that, you know, we do for whatever reason, either because we think it's good or just because we're trying to, their business is trying to make money and for the sake of greed even, and they continue to do them even though they know they're, they're bad. But there are a lot of things that, that we humans do that are not only damaging our own health, but at the same time are also damaging the environment. So there's this also, uh, this, this interface between making this switch to this, this seemingly simple thing of making a switch away from conventional personal care products to, um, natural ones are not only can be more effective and can be more supportive, much more supportive of your own health, but at the same time are actually supportive of the planet and the ecosystem and the environment around us. So it's kind of like you do something that's good for your own selfish interests and you're doing good for every, everybody else at the same time. That's so true. I love that. It's like the mic a microcosm and a macrocosm, mm -hmm. you know? We got mercury in our mouths and mercury in our seas and mer you know so we gotta if we can't control a lot of that we can start with our own bodies yeah um, but sorry sorry yeah. to interrupt well, okay. on that but uh, carry on with the, the whole sun stuff so the main this is the main issue that's so damaging is that sunscreens separate the uva and the uvb rays and the uva is what we're getting when we have sunscreen on, we're not getting UVB. It's the UVB that provides the vitamin D. So we're not getting that. And it's the UVA on its own that is damaging the skin. Mm. So it's like fully setting us, you know, the sunscreen thing is, is setting you up for many issues. Yeah. Um, and it's not gonna all happen on one day. It's gonna be, you know, over the lifetime. So. Yeah, I, I wanna add one thing on yeah. this. There was, there was just a huge systematic uh, literature review um, and for those that don't know what that is, that is a scientific review of basically all of the relevant research on a given topic. It's, it's the top of the hierarchy of evidence. It's considered basically the highest level of, sci of scientific evidence because it's basically uh, 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 an accumulation, a compilation of basically all of the relevant evidence. And there was one that was just done on the use of sunscreen uh, and the relevance to sunscreen use and skin cancer. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, and most people might find this shocking because they haven't actually read the research, but the science overwhelmingly does not support the idea that sunscreen use is protective of skin cancer. So there's this, there's this enormous you know, gap between sort of public thinking and the public conception around, oh, we, you know, the sun is bad, we need to use sunscreen to protect our skin from skin cancer and the actual scientific evidence which just flat out does not support the idea that sunscreen use is actually effective for preventing skin cancer yeah and i would venture to say probably gonna send you down a route <laughs> you don't want to go you know what i mean yeah. like it, and it could be part of the problem is what i'm saying yeah, yeah. not definitely not preventing and it could be contributing because yeah. again we're putting all these things and then we're baking it into our skin mm -hmm. not so good and then so we're denying the vitamin d that is anti-cancer on every single level mm -hmm. however you slice it and so and that yeah and then if we're just getting uva that's also when the skin damage starts and all that kind of stuff you know yeah. so and and really it, it turned i guess around the 50s or 60s but prior to that the sun was having a heyday. <laughs> now it would go in and out of fashion. And there was definitely times like literally even in the dark ages, it was also like, there was a sort of a, it was seen, you know, not proper to be in the sun and that kind of stuff too. But then there was like the Renaissance and everybody's celebrating the sun again. And then really at the turn of the century, there's those early 
um, you know, hygienists and, and natu European naturopathic doctors. And then in 1902, we have Neil Spinezen winning the Nobel Prize for heliotherapy, which is sun therapy. And then in the 20s, we have this great work from Dr. Rollier, who was in Switzerland and had these clinics where people were coming from all over and healing their tuberculosis and their rickets to a very successful level. And then, you know, there was, a, and then even Mademoiselle Coco Chanel, the fashion designer, was like, you know, every outfit needs a tan. <laughs> <laughs> it had an A day. And then, you know, then I don't know what happened, but I was like, cancer. And yeah. Yeah, I, one more point I want to add, because actually sun exposure and, and light and the effects of light on health is a particular area of passion of mine. But um, in addition to the, the study I just meant, the, the review of the, the studies on sunscreen use and skin cancer, I also want to mention here this fear of sun exposure in relation to um, skin cancer. And all these recommendations have, have kind of come out of this view of, oh, you know, the sun has this link potentially with melanoma. You know, we have this kind of idea. And we're looking at this very small sliver of the overall research specifically on this one type of cancer and the relationship of sunlight um, to this one type of cancer, this little sliver of the pie. But when we open up the whole pie and we look at the benefits, the relationship of sun exposure to all the different types of cancers, not just melanoma, but all of them, and lots of other different causes of mortality, this whole other paradigm emerges, which is that sunlight is profoundly supportive of good health and longevity and disease prevention, and specifically the prevention of dozens of other types of cancers. And there was a, a, a very big study just published uh, either last year or the year before that was, it, it was a very rare kind of study where they they tracked, I think it was something ridiculous, like 20,000 women or something like that, this huge number of, of, of people. It was a study in Sweden, and they tracked them over like 20 years. So it's one of these very rare studies with this huge number of people tracked over a very long period of time. They found that the health risk of avoiding sun exposure was on par, the actual effect size in terms of how much it damages your health was on par with smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. That's how damaging it was to your health to, to avoid, avoid sun. sun exposure. So there is wow. this just this this huge gap between the public's perception of sun exposure and, and the actual research around the link between sun exposure and, and health and disease prevention and longevity. Um, so it is profoundly supportive of preventing all kinds of diseases and extending our life. So anyway, I, I, this is your interview. I don't want to, no, no, I, I didn't want to take away from it, but I, I wanted to add that for, for I everybody. love sun research so much. And, and I feel like, yeah, there's new studies probably that come out all the time. Mm -hmm. One of the books I mentioned in my book is written by Dr. Bernard Ackerman. And it's, it's a hard book to get, um, but it's called Myth on Myth, Sun and Melanoma. And he was the founding father of dermatopathology, which is like beyond dermatology. It's like disease and the skin. And it, the book's like that thick. Mm -hmm. It's big. And he goes through every study up until that day. It was like 209. It was, it was printed in. And um, yeah, like the sun and the sun doesn't actually cause melanoma either. You know what I mean? Like he, yeah. he, he went deeply into it. He always sported a tan. Right. The skin doctor. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, even with it, we won't digress too much on that, but even within that one, the, the, the link between sun exposure and melanoma is even highly questionable once you start to, to dig into the research. Obviously, getting sunburned regularly is a problem, but getting sun exposure below the threshold of getting burned is, is not linked with, um, with skin cancer. And there's even studies showing that outdoor workers uh, have, have lower skin cancer rates than indoor office workers which and what and the, and probably that's like from fluorescent lighting yeah right so they're more susceptible and when we expose ourselves slowly but surely to the sun then we build up our melanin you know aka the base tan and we build up our bodies for that but the other thing is too it's it's lubricating the skin from within we have thousands of vitamin d receptors on our skin but in the depths of our body and they were designed they're vitamin d receptors they're designed to engage with the sun it's literally like like 
as soon as those sun rays hit our skin, our cell, our, our pores dilate to receive those rays, to receive the energy, convert it into this hormonal precursor and special types of, of a cholesterol, a cholesterol sulfate. And that sun skin reaction and communion is creating a water soluble vitamin D, which we cannot get in the fat soluble over the counter supplements. And so we can't just take the supplement and be fine. We need, well, you need both if you're like in the winter, we have winter, so we need that. Yeah. But that connection. And I like to think of it as cosmic pollination. Mm -hmm. And we are designed for that. Yeah, the vitamin D receptors tell us that it's an ancient relationship and we can trust it. Yeah. Beautifully said. So um, real quick, what do you think are some of the most supportive strategies for getting sun exposure and, and kind of supporting skin health in that process? Um, avoiding skin aging, supporting the, the sun's ability to adapt to that sun exposure, not be damaged by it, and to get all the benefits of, of the sun exposure without any downsides. Well, you want to, yeah, so be in the sun whenever you can and expose as much of your body as possible. If you still feel a little bit you know, shy about what I'm saying or whatever, put a hat on, hide your face, get your rest of your body, and that will create enough vitamin D. But, you know, so what I'll do is I'll lie out for whatever amount of time, I, you know, whatever. But, and then I'll, I'll put my face in the sun for like maybe five, ten minutes. So, it, you know, it comes in at the end. And because it does, it needs less sun. It is my face would get burnt earlier than my leg, for example. So you want to build it up. You've got to know your body. Everybody's different. You could have an Irish redhead or somebody from Morocco that's got a nice Mediterranean uh, skin tone. So we're all different. We all live in different parts of the universe. And I would take, there's an app called Vi the D-Minder. And that will tell you your weather, you know, you put in where you are, your geographical location, it will figure it out the weather that day. and will tell you how long you need to be in the sun to get the vitamin D. Mm -hmm. Now, you still may need to build up because you may be that Irish redhead. <laughs> so it may say 15 minutes, but you need to maybe start five minutes every day for a week. That's what um, Dr. Rollier would do. You know, you just do the calves for five minutes every day and then we build up to the thigh, you know, and, and you just slowly but surely get your body exposed and, and start, start in the spring and keep going in the fall. And it's also a great way to energize the body because it's working on a cellular level, it's igniting the ATP, it's helping create microbial peptides, you know, it's, it's, it's juicy. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Well, I, I, we could go, I'm sure, three more hours, and I've, I've really, really enjoyed this conversation. Um, and there's so much more I think we could talk about with nutrition and, and other aspects of, of personal care. Um, but I want to be sensitive to time here. Um, so uh, one thing that I'll, one comment I'll make, and then one question I have. Um, the comment is, I just want to mention to all the listeners how important this is for your your health and your energy levels to get rid of this constant, you know, bombardment of of your body, your bloodstream, and all your cells, your mitochondria, with all of these hormone disrupting chemicals, microbiome, gut microbiome, skin microbiome disrupting chemicals, um, heavy metals, hormone disruptors. One of the key steps in improving your health is you just, you have to clean up your personal care world of mm -hmm. everything that you're putting in and on your body when it comes to personal care. Um, with that in mind, I really love and appreciate what you're doing. You, I, I've looked at your products. You've also sent me a sample kit. I've also read your book. And you have like really top-notch products. I, I am honestly very, very impressed with your products. Uh, my wife has been raving about them and she, she absolutely loves them. Um, the one thing that I think is confusing is when I go on your site, there's like so many products that it's almost hard to know how to navigate that. So I would love if you could just kind of give somebody like a, a, a three-minute sort of shtick of maybe some of your most important products that you'd recommend to them um, and, and kind of how, how to think about navigating this, yes. you know, the, the 200 products on your site. Well, at first I just would like to say, I'm sorry about our navigation, but we are cleaning that up. We had to, we've been designing our, redesign our site and it's 
I'm going to be ready in June, July. So just know that and apologies for its issues. Well, um, I, I wasn't even implying there was an issue okay. with the site. I was just saying that there's just so it's many so products. It's just hard to know like where, where one should begin. We're a prolifically creative and also people really love when they're in, they're in and they love living libations. And so I feel like it's my duty to also say, don't worry, I'll take care of every aspect of your body so you don't have to go anywhere else because people kind of don't want to because, you know, they're like, well, we're here. This is the best we can't. <laughs> so I commit to really seeing. Also, I get, I get questions, thousands of questions a year. So I also know what people need and sort of what health issues we're having on our planet at this time. Like the crisis we're having with melasma, it's kind of crazy. Anyway, best skin ever is, is key. That is, it's called the best skin ever. We do have a few types. Pick a frankincense, see buckthorn. Those are like some good starters. And that is like a foundation. That's your one bottle to do it all. You could, you could, it can act like your most high end serum or your most, you know, and your basic cleanser. Men can use it as an aftershave. It can also use it even as a shave. You can use it for a cuticle oil. You can use it on your baby's bum for preventing a diaper rash. It's got you covered. So that is essential and that will help you do away with your soap. Then I would say like a dental serum, perhaps like the healthy gumdrops. So we have paste and gels and all that, but you could also just have that one dental serum and it could replace your toothpaste. You could just put one drop on your toothbrush and then do that one drop to floss. I think what people also have to get used to is like this is we make concentrated, potent, we don't like to dumb stuff down. We don't like to dilute it down per se. Um, and so what people may need to get used to is like, yeah, one drop, you know, it's not like a big squeeze of something. And it's very effective. So we've got that for the oral care, maybe switch over a deodorant to one of our poetic pits or underarm charms. We've got great men's ones like Radiant Earth. I love, I love the names, poetic pits, <laughs> that's great. And it's great because what it does is it, it works with your, your microbiome in your armpit. It makes, it takes your pheromones and then just delivers them in the most like juicy aromatic package. So you don't have to worry that there's also some of your sweat aroma mixed in there because it's going to make it like the perfume now. Like a, I don't mean like a feminine perfume, but like a good, like, oh my God, what's he wearing? Yeah. People come out of hot yogas and people are like, oh my God, what are you wearing? It literally makes men like Pied Pipers. Yeah, I, I have um, one of your men's essential oil mixes that's kind of like a, a scent and it's got oh, like, like a cologne? Uh, yeah, like spruce yeah. And, and a number of other kind of foresty, like tree derived uh, yeah. essential oil. There's your forest bathing in a cologne. Yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah. and I, I always get a lot of compliments when I wear that. So sweet. Yeah. yeah, so you could have a cologne, but I think, yeah, so if you just replace what you just feel is like, you just feel like you're really in some kind of commercial vortex with something and then just break out of that. Mm -hmm. But we really do, we got shave cream, shampoo, condi like juicy conditioners that you can leave on. We've got clay masks, honey masks. So once you've got some basics, there's, it's going for years. <laughs> Beautiful, I love it. So. Um, one quick question and maybe a, a request. I'm, I'm wondering if you would be willing to offer my listeners a little bit of a, a discount, if we could set up like a special link yeah. to, to offer them a discount if they are listening to this podcast and they want to come buy some of your products. Yes, let's set that up. Okay. And then your book, Renegade Beauty, can also be found on Amazon. Is that accurate? Yes. Like and all, any online bookseller has it. Okay. Exactly. Awesome. So, so we'll get everybody set up with a link to uh, the to your store, Nadine, uh, and a special discount code on this page. Um, and I will. I'm trying to think what we should. We haven't created the web page for this yet, but it will be uh, theenergyblueprint.com forward slash personal care and personal dash care. Uh, so we'll we'll set up that link and then. But on that podcast page, there will be a special link to get a discount in your store. And, uh, you know, again, I've, I've been experimenting with your products. They're great stuff. Um, my wife is like raving about them constantly. And, uh, and I also have closely looked at all of the ingredients of your stuff. And it truly is just top notch, like the best I've seen as far as personal care products. 
So highly, highly recommend it to everybody listening. And Nadine, thank you so much for this interview. It's been an absolute pleasure and, and really fun to have this conversation with you on, on so many fascinating topics uh, related to health, health and, and personal care. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure meeting you today. And yeah, really likewise. Awesome. Well, take care. And I, I hope this is the first of many conversations and I, I look forward to doing it again. Great. Thank you so much. Have a lovely time. Yeah. Take care, Nadine.